Hey guys, what's up? Today we're going to be going over peripheral vascular disease. This is probably one of the most common of those uh, like artery vein kind of diseases that shows up on the boards. This is one that's going to come back to get you with the intermittent claudication and we'll go we'll get into that as we move through our subject today. So, anatomy is the blood vessels peripheral vascular, the vessels, vascular, all that stuff. This is mostly going to affect the um, blood vessels in the extremities. So kind of down into the legs are more common than into the hands and stuff because we use our legs a lot for like walking, standing up, getting around and stuff like that. So those tend to be the ones that become symp symptomatic rather than the upper extremity. So essentially it is a narrowing of the blood vessels. And this is causing difficulty with blood flowing through the vessels. This is usually due to atherosclerosis, which is a sub, a, the big umbrella term for like arterial sclerosis and all that stuff. Essentially, it is the um, plaque buildup in the artery. And then this picture here, you can see on the right that it's showing how it's narrowing due to the atherosclerosis. So fatty plaque buildup usually due to high fat diets and that ends up getting into the blood vessels. Same kind of thing that's going on if you have fatty plaque buildup in your heart and you end up having blockage. It's kind of going on in the rest of your body. So this is restricting blood flow and causing difficulty with circulation and many other things. So as I said before, the primary factor is that atherosclerosis, that narrowing, the fatty plaque buildup, that's kind of the big if you are thinking about this, that is the big thing that is going on. Many other factors can either contribute to the atherosclerosis forming, or it can um, be another reason why they might be developing peripheral vascular disease. The first one is probably going to be any sort of autoimmune disease. I would say type 2 diabetes would fall right underneath all of that with the issues with the circulation due to type 2 diabetes. Smoking is another one. A lot of times they're going to tell you how the circulation is decreased due to any sort of restriction in the blood vessels because someone is smoking. So thinking about that, that they're more likely to have that claudication and many other things involving restricted blood flow. Hyperlipidemia, so hyperlip, the lipids, lipidemia. So hyperlipidemia, that is a lot of fat in the blood. The emia is blood. So a lot of fat in the blood. Obviously, that fat's got to build up somewhere. It's building up on the artery walls, causing that atherosclerosis. Essentially, a lot of these factors can be happened due to somebody having a very sedentary life or being overweight or obese. So all those can contribute to having any sort of high fat diet and all that stuff due to inactivity and obesity. That's another thing. Hypertension. So you think about it, the blood vessels are narrowing, which means that the pressure is increasing. If you think of physics, if you want to take a hose and you want to make it a really tight, like very aggressive stream, you'll put your finger over the edge of the hose. The water will shoot out a lot faster and a lot farther. That's essentially what's happening in the blood vessel itself. And then injury or surgery, this could also cause it due to the restriction of blood flow for any reasons or moving parts around as they have surgery. And then a family past medical history, this will contribute to this developing as well. If it's somebody has this in your family, it's genetic. So what does it look like? The biggest thing I'm going to talk about is intermittent claudication. So this is where the claudication all of those symptoms start to happen in the blood vessels and it happens intermittently. So it could happen for a couple minutes and then go away, or it could just kind of go on and off, on and off, depending on what you're doing. Symptoms are usually brought on by exercise and relieved with rest. So as this person starts moving, exercising, those blood vessels start to narrow. That's the claudication because it's all getting stuck. And then as they rest, it can relax. And then the blood flow kind of keeps going again. Essentially, the patient will describe this if you're thinking of a subjective way that they're describing it. Their legs are going to feel tired and they're going to feel weak and they want to like give out with any sort of prolonged exertion. So I was working with the patient actually yesterday and she was, she had diabetes. And so she'd get up, she'd do a couple exercises and then all of a sudden she's like, my legs are tired. I feel really weak. I feel like they're going to buckle. That's essentially how it's going to feel. So you got to like have them sit down and rest before they start doing exercises again. Other symptoms that you're going to see with this are they're going to have a loss of sensation. So due to that lack of circulation, 
and any sort of other issues they're losing any sort of sensation in their foot it's really or like i say foot but it could be anywhere and it'll feel like a numbness or tingling kind of sensation so that's also kind of going into there's not enough blood going to the nerves so the sensation to the nerves is not happening because there's not enough blood flow they're gonna have some pain at rest so it's gonna kind of like bother them and hurt and kind of feel like weak and uh, just no kind of thing going on and then the biggest thing is I'm talking about the poor circulation. So you're going to see that they're going to have slow healing if they have any sort of wounds because there's not enough blood perforating to the area. They're going to be cold. So you'll take off their shoe if you're going to work on their foot and it's freezing because they don't have the proper circulation because they have this peripheral vascular disease. If you see that, check their pulse. If it's their foot, check their pedal pulse to make sure that it's still strong and it's not weak and thready. Make sure that circulation is still going through. And then with all this being said, they'll have hair loss because there's not enough circulation getting to the hair to supply it. So it just kind of like dies and falls off. You'll also see that with arterial ulcers. So how are we treating it? Pharmacological management is probably number one on the list to work on that. Any sort of anticoagulants, antiplatelets, thrombolytics to make sure that there's not any sort of clots forming because those things can, the plaque buildups, everything that can pop off end up forming some sort of clot or something, making sure that the patient's not going to end up throwing a clot somewhere where there shouldn't, well, there shouldn't be clots anywhere, but somewhere dangerous like the lungs or something. The patient's probably going to be on some sort of statins to help lower their, um, the fat in their blood to kind of keep that going down to decrease their cholesterol. That's the exact same decreasing cholesterol. And for us as PTs, our interventions could be, we're going to be improving how far they can walk. So let's say they can only walk for like five minutes and they're like, I'm dead, I'm done. But we're going to work on making them work up the tolerance like six, seven minutes. We might have to take some rest breaks, but we want to get it up to a reasonable amount of time that they could be walking as if it, they're going to walk into the grocery store, pick up their prescription or something like that, some community distance. We can do the recumbent bike because that's nice. It's not your not weight bearing or anything like that. They can last a little bit longer because it's less of holding their body upright and it's good to improve their general cardiovascular endurance. We're going to work on a range of motion with this patient because they're probably very sedentary. They're not moving too much. We want to make sure that we keep that range of motion in their joints, that they're not losing any of that and getting any sort of contractures from just chilling out and not doing anything all day. PRE stands for progressive resistive exercises. So we can start with some long arc quads, stuff like that. Add some weight, maybe progress to like some sit to stand, stuff like that. Just kind of progressing through a sort of resistance program to start to build some more muscle and build muscular endurance. Essentially, what we're trying to do is improve the patient's functional independence. As I said before, I want to make sure they can stand up, get all the way to the bathroom, sit down, stand up, go back to wherever they were in their house, stand up, make themselves some food so then they're not unable to do the things that keep them alive, essentially. So we want to make sure that they're able to act independently and safely. And we want to put them on, well, we might, we're not the ones putting on it to registered dietitian or the doctor. They're putting them on a low cholesterol diet. So we as PTs have to adhere to that. If there's like candy in the clinic, this isn't a patient that we're letting dig into the candy bowl kind of thing. And then some surgical interventions, angioplasty. So that's where they'll take the balloon and put it in and blow it up to like push the plaque to the sides kind of thing. They'll do that commonly in the heart, but with peripheral vascular disease, that same kind of thing can be done in another part of the body. So another thing they'll do is if it's so clogged up there, they'll do a bypass. So they'll either take a vein or some other vessel from somewhere else and just bypass the area. If it's in their leg, that's super clodicated, then they'll just move on and redirect the blood flow. So when we're looking at this and we see this pop up on the boards, the biggest thing that's jumping out at you is intermittent claudication. That is the hallmark key thing that should be pointing you towards some sort of peripheral vascular disease or a peripheral arterial disease, something like that. That's big red flags. Pain, and this is the description of intermittent claudication, pain when walking or ambulating or on the bike or something like that, but it's relieved with rest. And it's going to continue to get worse if that person continues with that cardiovascular activity, such as walking or biking. That's the essentially the definition of the intermittent claudication of how it's going to appear to a patient. The atherosclerosis, so the fatty plaque buildup in the arteries, big thing leading towards any sort of peripheral artery disease or peripheral vascular disease. 
Pain and cramping in calves with exercise. This is probably the most common way that intermittent claudication is going to show up with any of your patients, either in the clinic or a sample question on the board. So that's going to be a big thing that's showing up. Poor circulation or sensation, as I said before, that's kind of like there, the, there's something wrong with the blood vessels. There's not any blood getting into the area. It's messing with their sensation. They're cold in their extremities. That's the last one. And all of those things that involve a lack of sensation due to poor blood flow to the area. So sample question today, guys. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient in an outpatient physical therapy clinic. The patient reports that her legs get tired and painful after five minutes of walking. However, pain is relieved with seated rest. What intervention would be most appropriate for the therapist to take? One, discontinue ambulation activities permanently. Two, bike for three minutes on, three minutes off for 15 minutes. Three, push the patient to walk for 10 minutes straight. Or four, move on to three by 10 repetitions of long arc quads. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is number two, bike for three minutes on, three minutes off for 15 minutes. Essentially with this patient, we want to improve their cardiovascular endurance. If that means we're doing like an on off kind of thing, this would be a three minutes on, three minutes off. So that one-to-one -one ratio is going to be working their, their aerobic system to make sure we're working on that endurance. So this would be the best answer for this patient to just work on that tolerance. If we have to take some breaks, that's okay, but let's get up to a number that we wanna make our goal. Discontinuing ambulation per activities permanently is not appropriate because this patient needs to, continue. if they were already walking, and let's say after five minutes they start to hurt, that means that they can functionally get up, walk around their house to get to where they need to go. We do not want to discontinue ambulation activities because that's sending the patient miles backwards. Pushing the patient to walk for 10 minutes straight, if they're already having pain and problems after five minutes, pushing them to 10 minutes might just wipe them out for the entire PT session. And congratulations, you can bill for one unit of TA and the patient's definitely not getting better. So you want to make sure that we're able to kind of work this patient up to those 10 minutes. That's why something like that biking, so taking them off of the walking, trying to work on biking to get their tolerance up, that might be a better option for this patient. And then moving on to three by 10 repetitions of longer quads. Now we do want to do some progressive resistive exercise with this patient, but by skipping all of the ambulation and the cardiovascular stuff and just moving on to progressive resistive, that's not the biggest thing that we want to work on. Of the importance with this patient, it is the cardiovascular endurance, and then we'll move on to range of motion strength. So I hope that this was helpful today, guys, to kind of go over peripheral vascular disease and the important things to pull out for the boards. All right. Take care, everybody.